Okay. Uh, radio journalist John Arneson said of today's speaker, for some reason, whenever I interview Montana author Ken Robeson, I end up calling him a true Montana jewel. I never go into the interview intentionally, meaning to say it, but listening to his stories and all, it just comes out. His tireless research continues, and how he unearths gems of the past is truly remarkable. As he told us on Voices of Montana, it comes down to a lot of research. There is no substitute for long hours of study <coughs> and travel looking for the best stories possible. Robeson is a Montana native who now lives in Great Falls. He served 30 years in the U.S. Navy as an intelligence officer, and he has now offered, authored seven books and served as a contributing author to three others. He focuses his efforts on chronicling Montana's forgotten history, especially as it relates to military history and African-American history. Today, he will be talking about his newest book, Montanans in the Great War, Open Warfare Over There. Please join us in welcoming Ken Robeson. Well, wow, good morning. So would you like me to talk about Montanans in the Great War? <laughs> Let's talk about some civil rights. You know, I grew up in the, you know, in the high school years in the 1950s, and I came off a farm in Shoto County. Uh, I think at that point, Shoto County may have had zero African-American residents. But I went off first to the university and then to the Navy, and the whole experience in the Navy was really, among other things, among many things, was we were integrating the Navy. We were making up for lost time in all of the services, but to some extent maybe Navy was the worst. And yet, ironically, the Navy had had integrated black crews since, well, since the Revolutionary War. And in the Civil War, for instance, something like 16% of the crews on board ship in the Union navies, w they were black. And yet some, and, and even then there were limitations, but on the other hand, there were a lot of rates open for, the, for them then. Somehow after the Civil War, things got worse. And when I joined the Navy in the early 1960s, blacks could be, well, service industry jobs like they were in your communities. They could be the uh, stewards or the cooks. And one of the things that I found myself able to do as I got up in rank, where I was actually running parts of operations, was find ways to integrate the crews. For instance, making a deal with the executive officer to screen all the jackets for, this was on the USS Constellation in 19, say 1972, and I'd screen the service jackets, pick, I was expanding the intelligence center staff, I needed about 10, well I selected two African Americans that were, they all had to be undesignated seamen. And I brought them into the intelligence center and they became photo interpreters. I probably the Navy's first two photo interpreters. So, so I had some experiences along the way within the Navy. And when I got back to Montana and started I had control of my time, how wonderful was that? And I got to uh, look into what had been written about Montana history and what had been written about Montana history was a whole lot of stuff about white people. Um, we were well, well represented. I mean, the richer the better as far as the coverage in our histories, but if you weren't white, you probably didn't, you were invisible. Now. You can say, well, 
but it was only a fraction of the population. That's nonsense. Look at the stories that can come out if you really dig and find that Ozark Club story in Great Falls, that jazz nightclub owned by, ironically, at the very time when Great Falls totally excluded Chinese, here was this half Chinese and half black guy, Leo Lamar, running the greatest jazz club from Midwest to the West Coast. And, you know, so it isn't that there aren't really compelling stories. Another compelling story, I'm not going to talk about it today, but I'm off on a tangent, so let me tell you just <laughs> one word about it. You all probably know that Fort Shaw is named for Robert Gould Shaw, Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, that blue-eyed boy of fortune from Boston who headed the 54th Massachusetts. And his assault on Camp Wagner on the approaches to Charleston, South Carolina, with his black regiment, first one in action, raised in the north. And they were decimated. Shaw was killed. Half of his regiment were casualties. And yet, here we have, right outside Great Falls, Fort Shaw, named for Robert Gould Shaw. That's really cool, but how many people in Montana know that? But also, I think even cooler is that two of Colonel Shaw's men who scaled those fortifications at Camp Widener and lived through it came to Montana after the war. Joe Meek was a silver miner in the Little Belt Mountains. He died and he's buried in Maine Cemetery in White Sulphur Springs. The other was Sergeant Alexander Branson. Alex came to Lewistown after the war, well after the war, because Lewistown didn't get started until 18, early 1880s. But he was one of the first, and he'd already been in Montana ranching and doing various things. He was, I, I found, very good evidence, he was the very first man recruited in the 54th Massachusetts. So those are, you know, those are just the tip of the iceberg. And I'm going to be, if I get off my tangent and get on my <laughs> subject, I'm going to be talking about a chapter in a book that you see here. It's a state-by-state -state survey throughout the West two outstanding black history scholars, Bruce, Bruce Glassrude and Carrie Wentz. Uh, they did the Harlem in the West book, of, among other things. The, the f f preface to it is by Quentin Taylor, or uh, Quinter Taylor. If you know Dr. Taylor, he's, he's the great African-American historian in the West, centered at University of Washington. And, I'll, I'll mention later what Montana Historical Society's been doing. Well, Quintard Taylor's been doing it for, for years. Go to a website called blackpast.org and you'll see a marvelous collection of, of biographies and stories and so on. So, let's get underway here. I, uh, I think the least hidden story in, in Great Falls probably was, and maybe in Montana, was Alma Jacobs. Alma was this pretty, uh, pretty incredible young woman who went through Great Falls High School in the early 1930s. And she was, her, her yearbook said she was this kind, gentle, young woman in, in the yearbook. She went off to Talladega, Talladega good old segregated black university Talladega to college, but then she topped it off by a degree at Columbia University at, in uh, library sciences. Came back in 1946 to Great Falls, Montana, uh, 
and she was hired as catalog librarian. Now, I don't know about other communities in Montana, but, but that probably was the first professional woman, black woman hired in Great Falls, Montana for any job. And eight years later, she was hired as the librarian. They were so cautious because they were concerned about the staff, you see the color of the staff, <laughs> that they made her the temporary director for a six month period. The staff loved her, she was incredibly capable. And she was doing all kinds of things in the community like persevering through two failed bond issues to get a library and finally on the third try she brought the community to the library that's in Great Falls today. She was on the interracial council and, and the uh, uh, Air Force Base and the community were finally getting together to, to take some action to break down the barriers in the bars, nightclubs, restaurants, everything in Great Falls was segregated or discriminated. Let me just read very briefly, I want to do this. It was a typical sunny day in Great Falls, Montana, largest city in 1955. On the surface, all seemed well. The local economy was fueled by the three largest employers, the Anaconda Copper and Zinc Refinery, Great Falls Railroad Repair Facility, and Great Falls Air Force Base. The morning shift at the Anaconda refinery clocked in with no black faces among the 2,500 highly paid employees, all members of the mine, mill, and smelter workers union. African Americans could not join that union or any other local union, thus they were shut out of the good paying jobs. Black airmen from the air base visited downtown on their day off as well as local black residents like Alma Jacobs, and they could not enjoy lunch at the town's restaurants or get haircuts at local bar barber shops. They could be seated only in the theater balconies and sometimes shut out entirely from being able to get tickets. In the evening, black airmen were not welcome in the city's restaurants, bars, and nightclubs. Only on the seedy lower south side could those airmen find refuge in those bars and cafes and brothels? And at one black owned nightclub, the Ozark Club, how had Jim Crow become so institutionalized in Gray Falls, Montana? And I do uh, spend a little time going through the, the history of that. But let's move on to Helena. How many of you recognize this pretty fabulous lady? <laughs> Clarissa Jane Powell, I see a hand. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Clarissa Jane Powell came as, she may have started the journey as a slave, although um, she was certainly freed. She was the household slave of the Morgan family and uh, they came to Montana Territory from Missouri, as so many others did. They brought uh, Clarissa Jane, who was 16 years old, and they had a, a son, uh, John uh, Morgan Evans. It was the Evans family, I'm sorry. So John Morgan Evans was 16 year old. They were very close, they'd bonded, uh, and Clarissa Jane now had her freedom, but she was, you know, where would she go? She'd been treated well as a slave in the Morgan, in the Evans household, and they brought her here. They, they put her in Helena and, and paid for her education. And so she was off to start. They went on to Deer Lodge and within some years, uh, John Morgan Evans became a, a congressman from Montana, another Confederate family that succeeded in in uh, territorial Montana. Uh, living with a, a good education. And she met James Wesley Crump, who had grown up as a free black in uh, Kansas, had fought 
in the Civil War in a black Kansas artillery unit. And then as soon as the war was over, he joined a, a wagon train. Uh, it's got a, the story of uh, Clarissa Jane and James Wesley Crump marrying and beginning the Crump Howard family here in Helena. They've been here since the 1860s. Uh, it's, it's the most, well, I guess Ray actually left for a couple of decades, but I, I ignore that and I say the Crump Howards have been in Montana and in Helena probably longer in one location than any other black family because so many black families that came to places like Great Falls, as soon as the kids got off on their own and the elders passed away, they headed to the West Coast, but then so did the white kids. But in the case of blacks, it was, they couldn't join unions, they couldn't get decent jobs, and, and, and there was no future because their fathers had faced the same thing and their grandfathers had faced the same thing. And, and there was really no progress apparent so here's James Wesley Crump, sergeant, with the Grand Army of the Republic in 1902 when the Capitol was dedicated. He was selected to carry the American flag, which was pretty cool. <laughs> On t if, if you saw today's uh, IR or the Missoulian, um, Kim Brigham has a review of my book, but he, he includes so most of what I have in the book on uh, Ray Howard, and uh, I, unfortunately I, I never met Ray uh, after he passed away, and I, I had started researching black history, and I, I got full-time back to Montana in 2001, and I, I saw the total void there in black history. Lang had written a nice article years ago on on uh, the Helena African American community when it was as large as 500. And so there were a few things, but there were very few things. And, and, and so I have made it a point since then as I've written books on the three on the Civil War. I even found a, Joe Wells, a, a, a black who was taken into the Confederate Army for my Confederates in Montana Territory, uh, the second of my Civil War books. But back to Ray Howard, let, let me read just briefly the environment in, in Helena at the time. In 1948, the Pittsburgh Courier surveyed state capitals around the country to show the extent to which democracy is being practiced. Now, Pittsburgh Courier is a black newspaper in which democracy is being practiced in the United States. Norman C. Howard, a leader of the black community in Helena, Montana, and George S. Schuyler, a black socialist, wrote about the paradoxical racial situation in Montana's capital city and the lives of the 75 African Americans in the population of about 16,000 in Helena at the time. So it had gone down from 500 to 75 by 1940, well, the late 1940s. Um, the Pittsburgh Courier observed, on one hand, they, they, colored people, enjoy a large measure of freedom and live the good American life. On the other hand, they are subjected to the restrictions all too familiar elsewhere in our land of the free. Unlike Great Falls, <clears throat> black residents in Helena could live in all but the most affluent residential areas and most owned their, their homes while in earlier times, most of Helena's blacks attended St. James AME Church. By the 1940s, many were welcomed at white churches. One black nurse worked at the hospital treating patients of all races and black patients received equal treatment there. There was no color line in the, middle, in the public schools of, <clears throat> of Helena, which had come a long way from 1910 when a portrait of General Robert E. Lee in his Confederate uniform was prominently displayed at Helena High School. <clears throat> black students studied and played alongside their white classmates. An exclusive high school club, the 3777, 
welcome to black sophomore, an honor few white sophomores received. <clears throat> the three black students in high school attended school parties and dances. Star athlete Raymond C. Howard, son of Norman Howard, experienced discrimination at Helena High School. Despite being class president and one of the greatest athletes in school in, by the way, all, all Montana history, Ray couldn't date white girls and was never invited to private parties. If he stopped in the hallway to talk to a white girl, an administrator might say, you know, that's not too good an idea, Ray. You'd better be careful. So uh, let me just interrupt a second. I'd like to invite Sydney. This is probably a good time for you to come. You were in high school with Ray, yeah. so come, come join us here for a few minutes. Thank you, thank you so much. My friend Helen Morris and Deal Hoffman and I, friends since first grade, were both in high school with Ray. He was a couple of years ahead of us and he was wonderful. We loved him, truly. And I was not aware of some of the things we have just heard about in Helena, although I was aware of some. I do have to say a couple of things. He did date one of our friends and we were all very envious. My understanding a little later though was it was the boys who didn't like him dating white girls. So I said to my mother one day, if Ray Howard asked me out, this was pretty unlikely, he was a big deal, I was very small potatoes. If Ray Howard asked me out, would you let me go out with him? And my mother thought for a minute and she said, you know, I have so much respect for his mother and father this is Norman and Maxine at the Montana Club. I have so much respect for his parents. I would have to say yes, but I don't know what your grandfather would say. <laughs> <laughs> now that never really got tested, you realize. <laughs> In any event, much later, my son married Ray's niece, Terry Ladd. Chuck Ladd at the time had a job at, the, at Fort Harrison in, I think, a lab. He was well-educated. And many years later, I also reconnected with Ray when he came back to Helena. And we talked about what was going on then, because it was during the you know, civil rights era. All kinds of things were happening. And he mentioned that Helena wasn't totally ideal, but it was pretty good, just as we've heard. And he said, but you know, I had to leave Helena before I learned what it was to be black. And I think that was very understandable. But again, we all went to church together, to school together, and so on. So I'm really happy to have these wonderful stories from you. One more quick thing, for a time, Ray dated a beautiful Indian girl. In fact, we said she was an Indian princess. Uh, her name was Arlene Lanframboise. She later went on to a career in the military. But I think at that time, they were a handsome couple. And I think at that time, everybody kind of said, yeah, that works. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, have loved and admired Ray all his life and many of the other black residents of Helena. So I'm delighted we have this wonderful man giving us stories. Alice Harrell was my daughter's second grade teacher, another black family here. I could go on then into the era where I worked with the Black Student Union at Carroll College when 10 urban black young men upward bound came and the campus went bananas. I'm hoping you will write about that in your next book. Thank you all. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Sydney. Let's move on to Missoula. This uh, great university in this great town had had the 25th Infantry out, out at Fort Missoula since, um, gosh, the 18, I should have looked this up, 18, late 1870s. And, you know, if you have a, a black regiment, right next to your town, even though the resident black community is relatively small, it will tend to grow 
and you will see a lot of African Americans in your midst. Now, uh, despite that, the University of Montana hadn't seen any until the uh, early 1930s. And let me read just a, a, a bit about uh, the very first graduate from the University of Montana. James W. Dorsey, the son of a 25th Infantry soldier. This was so common. The movers and shakers in the early Great Falls, you know, Great Falls didn't develop until the 1880s, and they had Fort Shaw, and the soldiers would, would leave the Army or they'd retire and they'd come to Great Falls. Missoula, the same way. And the guys that the community, the white community, most respected and best accepted were out of the Civil War uh, or out of the Indian Wars, Buffalo soldiers and, and black soldiers. So James Dorsey was a son of an infantry uh, soldier. He became the first black to graduate from the university, born in at Fort Missoula in 1897, he played football track and worked as a janitor, sign painter, and decorator to put himself through the university. Graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology in 1922, five years later he received a law degree from the law school, so he had a double first. Where did he go to practice law? Would he have been successful in any town in Montana? Of course not. He headed to Milwaukee, and in Milwaukee, he not only had a very successful career as a litigator, as a lawyer, but he became very active in the civil rights movement in Milwaukee and was one of the cities and state uh, Wisconsin leaders in civil rights. He wasn't totally forgotten because in uh, uh, later, more recent years, he was brought back, he, he actually did come back to Montana fairly often, so he, he had good memories from, from Missoula and he was made a distinguished alumnus of, from the University of Montana. African American Nesby Doc Reinhardt came to Montana in 1931 from, from Milwaukee, ironically, to play football, basketball, and track and field. After graduating in 1935 from the university, Reinhardt was hired to serve as the head athletic trainer, and he stayed on for 47 years at the university. He was there when I was there. Um, I wasn't a big athlete, so I didn't get close to, uh, I mean, he didn't work on my sore bones and body, but anyway, uh, he and... Uh, I mean, his story is, is just legendary, really. And, and he found a way to carve a niche within the athletic community to stay in Montana. Kim Brigham in mid-January did an article for the Missoulian that uh, covered the portion I have in here because I thought it was uh, fascinating and, and important for national people to know how important not just Mike Mansfield as Senate Majority Leader was, but how important Mike, uh, uh, Senator Metcalf was in passing the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So I go through that and Kim covered that in his review, but basically in 1964 on the heels of Kennedy's assassination and and Johnson, President Johnson's determination to pass civil rights legislation, it had momentum. But Eastland and the other Southern senators would have killed it except that Mansfield had put Metcalf in place as president pro tem of the Senate and his parliamentary skill along with Mansfield's power, the two of them managed to overcome massive filibustering and get that passed before the end of 1964. That was the first big breakthrough in legislation that a city like Helena or Great Falls needed. But there was a second very important piece of legislation needed, and that's within Montana when in 19... 72, they gathered together 
non-office holding members of the Montana to form the new Montana Constitution, all the communities had a chance and, and they took advantage of it for a, 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 a really enlightened new constitution. It was not written by the Copper Kings <laughs> as the first one was. Arlene Reichert, the sole lady in the photo here, those are the three that were uh, still living from the 2000, I mean from the uh, 1972 convention from Great Falls. Uh, the other two, um, but this was in 2016. Arlene was still going strong. She was only 90 at that time. She's now 94. Um, and they managed to pass groundbreaking dignity, dignity clause. And we don't, you know, how many times have you pulled out the Montana Constitution to read this? But So I'm going to read it. The dignity of the human being is inviolable. No person shall be denied the equal protection of the laws, neither the state nor any person, firm, cor corporation, or institution shall discriminate against any person in the exercise of his civil or political rights on account of race, color, sex, culture, social origin, or condition, or political or religious ideas. I mean, that's powerful stuff, and you put that 1972 clause together with the 1964 civil rights legislation and for the South and the states that needed it, fortunately Montana really didn't, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, uh, the stage was set for a significant change at last. Now let's talk a little about uh, some things when I started researching African American history in 2001, it was tough sledding. I, as I mentioned, a very, uh, I, it's, it wasn't even a handful. There might have been three or two articles in any journal I could find that had been written about Montana blacks. Uh, sometimes in recent decades before then, during Black History Month, the dailies in Montana would put together a, a in some cases, quite a, quite a good local Black History story featuring some known characters, but my gosh, it was hard. I, I, with a friend of mine, Bob Harris, we were doing a lot of research one of the things, and I'll come back to this one in a moment, but one of the things I did was I came up with biographies anywhere from a few sentences to a couple of pages for 1,100 African Americans that lived in the Great Falls community over the years since 1884 when the town site first started. Actually, it was 1886 because there were no blacks there for the first two years. And those stories are integrated in a two-volume Early Settlers of Great Falls. And that's, I mean, when we talk about Black History Month, when we reach the point where we don't need it any longer, I think it'll be a good sign we've succeeded. <laughs> Carter Woodson, Dr. Woodson started it in, in the 1920s because this second graduate, black graduate from Harvard University, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, was greatly bothered by the fact that no history was being taught to the young African American population. So he started the Journal of Negro History and he started Black History Week, which then expanded to a month. And he did it because blacks were being left out of history. And my experience in Montana was the same thing was happening here much later than Carter Woodson. So when we begin to start including African American stories, and frankly, all ethnic stories, and I, I greatly applaud Dr. Uh, Bob Swartout for his Montana Cultural Medley. He selected my article on 
early Great Falls African Americans and the Ozark Club to be the African American chapter in here. But the Métis are here, the Chinese, the Norwegians. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful uh, ethnic collection, Montana Cultural Medley. And now there are books like a biography of Taylor Gordon coming out. How great is that? And as I've mentioned before, the books I've done on the Civil War and the two I've done on, on World War I covered the African Americans. There were only 198 blacks that served from Montana in World War I, but you couldn't find a word about them before. And now there are in at least two books. Back to this wonderful site. This is Montana Historical Society's Montana's African American Heritage Resources. I should have Kate Hampton come up and talk about this, but she'd, she'd turn it into a, a full-scale lecture because it's a wonderful site. It has everything from, from lesson plans for teachers to a, a, an exhaustive survey of the 500,000 or 5 million or whatever it is artifacts and things here in the Montana Historical Society. And it all started when Kate and Bob Harris and myself, Patty Dean and a few others met almost 20, well, 15 years or more ago to talk about how little the Montana Historical Society was doing with black history. It was almost invisible on their website too, even though they have a tremendous collection. And, and thank goodness, thanks to Coal Trust Money and some really great work by Kate and others from the Historical Society, this site is now a, a major resource to be used by students or scholars or writers about African American uh, history and stories. So uh, great applause and shout out to the Montana Historical Society for that. And I guess just a couple other things. Who on earth would have thought in 1955 when we were in high school <laughs> that we'd lose the, oh, came back, that uh, Alma Jacobs would be a mural on the side of a building, or any African American would be on the side of a building in Montana. There's been no graffiti, thank God. There's been no, I mean, everybody's applauded it, they think. They think this community leader and exceptional librarian deserves it. So we've, we've come a long way. Every year we have in Great Falls, now this was the 11th year. We have what's called Black Heritage Evening in the basement of the library. The basement r room is rated for 120 people and we've, we've approached that a number of times. All the, the six black churches in Great Falls, there's still black churches in Great Falls. Three of them are very, very active. Um, they all come, and we have a wonderful time sampling soul food and listening to uh, gospel music. Uh, two nights ago, the uh, Great Falls Gospel Choir was singing at Carnegie Hall with other gospel choirs. Um, so good things are happening. At the uh, 2011, which would have been the second of the Black Heritage Evenings, this colonel was it we invited. He was then the uh, 341st Missile Wing. That's the ICBM Missile Wing, the, the big guy at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Anthony Cotton, African-American. When 30 years ago, a black officer might have hoped to make major at the best. So Colonel Anthony Cotton came and spoke and he talked about his grandparent, his great grandparent <laughs> slaves and his grandparent um, on, their, on their small f farms in the South and what progress the Air Force and the communities were making. Now 11, no, nine years later, Colonel Cotton's a four-star Air Force general and on the rise. 
This year, you recognize this guy. Another remarkable story, uh, Mayor Wilmot Collins came and gave, I mean, he's such a great storyteller, and he, he gave this just great storytelling talk, motivational talk. And as you saw from the group, we get probably 40% kids at that event, and, and a lot of them are African-American kids. It's an interracial audience, but uh, most of the black kids, I think, around Great Falls are coming, coming to that. So anyway, uh, there's a, a tremendous amount in this civil rights movement in the West, black Americans in the civil rights movement in the West. Um, my chapter is, I think, the most interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I certainly was very pleased to share it with you, but I'll tell you, when you read what the uh, California <clears throat> or Denver or Seattle <clears throat> authors had to put together, struggling through the black power movements and what it took in their cities to come maybe as far, maybe further than Montana, but certainly make progress it was a hell of a lot harder than it was in Great Falls and Missoula and Helena. But on the other hand, when you had the 1950s, when, when you as a black airman or you as a black athlete or would be unable to go to a restaurant, a nightclub, or you know, you were totally shut out of the community, separated but equal back then, even in Montana. Thank you very much.